gentlemen, thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you to Kadal and thank you for all the things, uh, or new insights uh, into discussions here in the uh, entire day uh, from yeah, people from all over the world. Uh, but also thank you very much for inviting me uh, to this conference on a very uh, special date. And uh, I've got prepared a, a speech, a little bit more general from the German or European perspective to human rights. And uh, we have focused on the very... Uh, tough things of political prisoners, but the human rights debates in the common, current days, it's a little bit more diverse. And I will speak about, uh, in the beginning, um, about uh, the historical framework, the human rights in a communist dictatorship, and third, about the peaceful revolution in autumn uh, 19, 89 and the German unity in 1990. Uh, fourth, uh, the complexity of the world in 2016, and then about the role of human rights today with some lessons learned from my uh, post in, in the German government as a human rights commissioner. Let me start uh, with a uh, few reflections to this day. The European Parliament chose this day to remember the verse past experiences in Europe and named it the International Day of Remembrance of Victims of Totalitarian Totalitarianism. Some left-wing uh, politicians argued against uh, mixing together victims of German NS terror regime with victims of Russian suppression and their respective crimes against humanity. The historic perception is different in different European nations. Many people suffered under the terrible crimes committed by Stalin and the communist leaders in Russia, for example, the people in the Baltic states. Germans need to be aware of their responsibility for the unique event that was uh, the Holocaust, also in the future. Also the first panel here at the conference in Argentina covered the Holocaust and anti-Semitism. Coming to terms uh, with the past is one of the most challenging tasks for nations like Germany with such a terrible history. And please remember we had two dictatorships in Germany, one before and during the Second World War II and one after it in East Germany in the ter territory occupied by the Russians. Finding adequate ways to describe complex histories is always a challenging task. And today we have to be aware of the historic situation. Sometimes it is more enlightened to compare dictatorships with each other rather than comparing a dictatorship with a democracy. At least from a German point of view, we are all, myself included in this speech in particular, treating on sensitive ground. First, the historical framework. Today, exactly 77 years ago, on 23rd August of August, 1939, the Hitler-Stalin Pact was signed. It was a German-Soviet non-aggression pact and it paved the way for World War II. Hitler and Stalin agreed not to go to war with each other and to split Poland. The outside world was stunned by this agreement given that Stalin and Hitler espoused diametrically opposed ideologies. 
Hitler started the invasion of Poland on 1st of September 1939. The Red Army of the Soviet Union invaded Poland from the east 16 days later on 17th of September 1939. Both dictators pursued causes defined by their own political needs. On October 17, 1939, the Communist International welcomed the invasion as an example of cooperation of socialist nations against Anglo-French imperialism. I have to check this because I do not know whether this is really meant to apply to the NS regime as well. The Nazi party was called the National Socialist German Workers' Party. That leads us to a first assumption. It is more important to differentiate between democracy, rule of law and protecting human rights on the one hand and totalitarian dictatorships with highly effective propaganda on the other hand than to look at the incompatible contradicting ideologies of authoritarian regimes. Last week, 10 days ago, on 13th of August, we remembered the 55th anniversary of the erection of the Berlin Wall in 1961. At the end of World War II, Poland's borders had shifted westwards and Germany became divided into East and West. This happened because the Allies conquered Adolf Hitler and the Nazi terror regime in 1945 and because of decisions taken in conferences in Yalta and in Potsdam. After World War II, a period of Cold War began between the powers of the Western Bloc as represented by the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, and the powers of the Eastern Bloc. A lot of communication on both sides at that time were shaped by ideologies. But at the end of the, but at the, end of the day, you could say that the US, Great Britain and France were striving for a free world with free markets. The Soviet Union with its dictator Stalin and its socialist satellite states, satellite states was promoting a communist world system without personal freedoms or rights and with a planned economy. As I have already mentioned, if we are going to be, to be speaking about human rights before and after the war of the Berlin Wall, we have to be aware of this historical background. There was less legitimacy on the eastern side compared to the free world in the west. That is due to the fact that human rights were not protected by the Soviet Union and its, uh, and its socialist satellites. Rather, in that part of the world, elementary civil rights and liberties were heavily abused by state authorities. Not all communist countries might be seen very much as being totalitarian states, like Germany under the Nazi dictatorship or China under Mao. But the German philosopher Peter Sloterdijk made a disturbing statement with regard to the, to the NS terror regime which was responsible for the murder of over six million Jewish men, women and children, as opposed to communist countries where dozens of millions died in China and the Soviet Union alone. I quote, the ideology of classes 
called Marxism and Leninism and Maoism came at a far higher price than the ideology of races. Second, human rights in a communist dictatorship. After World War II, the four allies influenced development in West and East Germany in line with their own political agendas. Both sides were supported by, or, but uh, also exploited by Washington and Moscow, respectively. The West Germans acted freely and because of, its, uh, of the benefits like the Marshall Plan and quick and successful economic development in the shape of the uh, German Wirtschaftswunder. West Germany got a new basic law which guaranteed the rule of law, free and fair elections and the protection of human rights. I quote from the German constitution, the basic law article 1, human dignity shall be inviolable, the respect, to respect and protect it shall be the duty of all state authorities. The German people therefore acknowledge inviolable and inalienable human rights as a basis of every community of peace and of justice in the world." End of quote. On paper, the first constitution of East Germany, officially, officially called German Democratic Republic, sounds very nice too, even regarding civil rights and liberties. But the reality experienced in East Germany quickly became quite different. In the late 1980s, I was involved in the civil rights movement. I became a member um, and founder of a small oppositional group under the umbrella of the Protestant Church in my hometown Forst on the border with Poland, not far from Berlin. We wanted to open the country up, get rid of dictatorship. The GDR was a true dictatorship, even if at that time many Western diplomats didn't like to say so. And after reunification, some professors came up with all kinds of arguments designed to rebut this assessment of the East German experience. The GDR, however, used Marxist Leninist terms describing itself as a, quote, dictatorship of the proletariat. I was once told by an official in my hometown that we, a bunch of opposition activists and yeah, an eco ecumenical peace group shouldn't be discussing civil participation. Here in the GDR, we don't have democracy. We have the dictatorship of the proletariat. I was informed. And it was, of course, the state official, not the proletarians in our group, who dictated policy in the GDR. To this day, I am most grateful <coughs> for such clarification. Now, too, dictators and authoritarian rulers must be taken seriously. Let me warn you, they are not Democrats, they, but they are often extremely shrewd politicians who use their power with uh, consummate skill. That still holds true, even when there is nothing new about the methods they use. In the late 1970s and the 1980s, before the war came down, the socialist uh, centrally planned economy in East Germany had obviously already lost the ideological battle against the social market democracy, the social market economy in the West in West Germany. The specific um, West German answer combines a free economy which was much more innovative than central planning, 
with social responsibility, which also ensured the welfare of millions of workers during the first three decades, decades of uh, the Federal Republic of Germany was founded in 1949. Of course, the economic challenges in the East were much bigger than in the West after the war. The Russians did not support economic growth. On the contrary, they rebuilt factories and railways in the destroyed regions solely in order to produce goods as, uh, as reparations and transport them to the Soviet Union. But that was not the crucial, so crucial for the people in the East. Millions left their homes for a better life in the West where there was a prosperous, uh, prosperous economy and better living conditions. But after the Berlin Wall was built in 1961, they risked their lives just to get into the other part of the city of Berlin and to be free. For me, and from a human rights perspective, the struggle between the East and the West was not about economic, social or cultural rights. It was about the civil rights or personal freedoms. But even with regard to social rights, in the health sector, labor conditions, assistance for disabled people or the educational system, the situation in West Germany was much better than in the East. The former GDR, the East German state, existed for 40 years. During that time, around about uh, 88,000 people were arrested as political prisoners, or better, as prisoners of conscience. There was no free speech, no freedom of the press, no freedom of opinion, and all the violations of human rights you have mentioned in the different countries and discussions occurred, maybe in a more or less moderate uh, manner. But also children were indoctrinated with the ideology of Marxism and Leninism. Only a few people were actually murdered by the East German intelligence service, the, St uh, the Stasi, but it did happen. I shy away from comparing the situation in the 1970s or 80s in East Germany with what is happening in other countries today. Perhaps the situation regarding civil liberties was much better than in Korea in 2016, and more or less uh, comparable uh, with the situation in Cuba today, but it's difficult to say this. The new information and communication technologies have changed a lot of things. And East Germany were in a very specific situation in the Eastern Bloc, in the Eastern Bloc because of uh, many linkages to uh, West Germany, historically, uh, family uh, relatives, uh, in, in the other part of the country, the language was the same, business uh, was going on and, and deepened. Uh, so we, we cannot really compare this with other countries. Now, as then, however, we should not be under any, solu uh, any illusions about the nature of uh, certain political systems. It is important to think clearly, after all, even if for diplomatic, political, or economic reasons, one cannot always speak frankly. Let me come to the third part, the peaceful revolution in autumn 1989, and German unity on 3rd of October 1990. Uh, to speak about what happened before and after the fall of the war, let me tell you a short but essential story about, yeah, I would like to call it 
freedom, freedom came before unity. It is a personal story about the key messages of our freedom revolution. The collapse of East Germany started with rigged local elections in May uh, 1989 and ongoing protests against the government. Many people fled the country via Hungary during the summer. The embassies in Budapest and Prague uh, were overcrowded with those who wanted to escape. On 10th of September 1989, Hungary officially opened its border with, with Austria. But also inside East Germany, more and more people were taking part in peaceful demonstrations in the streets. They were not thinking about leaving the communist state. One goal was to achieve more openness and freedom of opinion and the press. They wanted to change the political system. They were chanting, we are the people. That means democracy. Uh, they were hungry for democracy and freedom. The peaceful demonstration, which took place on Monday, 9th of October 1989 in Leipzig is the most important date when you are talking about the collapse of the East German regime. No one knew whether the forces of the state would intervene. After some other demonstrations on 7th of October in Berlin and the little town of Plauen and, and the official acknowledgement of the opposition uh, as negotiating partners on 8th of October in Dresden, the rally on 9th of October uh, was in fact, yeah, also for me personally, the tipping point. The situation had remained peaceful because there were there were so many ordinary people who had the courage to go out and join the peaceful demonstration and peaceful revolution. On 19th of October 1989, just one week later, double the number, namely 150,000, demonstrated on the streets of Leipzig and many other cities in East Germany. On 6th of November, Around 600,000 marches demonstrated in the pouring rain. Freedom came first when the Berlin Wall fell on 9th of November 1989, four weeks later. Before the wall came down, people had been chanting, we are the people. Now they are chanted, we are one people, which meant the demand for, your, uh, for German unity. After the fall of the world, after the fall of the war, free and fair elections took place. Intimidation was everywhere, but people overcome, overcame their fear. After that day, the 9th of October 1989, I personally no longer feared it might be all and in a bloodbath. Freedom came first. What people wanted in the first place was freedom. Freedom of opinion, freedom of travel, of the press, of the arts, of scholarship and research. That's why the day is so important. But what are the lessons we should learn from freedom first? Then as now to the totalitarian systems, dictatorships and authoritarian regimes as well survive only because people living in their oppressed societies are afraid to say what they really think and feel. That makes human rights so important. That is exactly the situation in several countries today where people are unable to say 
what they are really thinking because of a climate of fear. Often I have heard the opinion the West won the Cold War. I think that's not true. That's a typically Western view of things. History as heads of state see it. But up to 9th of November 1989, their chief concern was stability. It was only when the war came down that they realized how strong the desire for, pre for freedom and change was among ordinary people. The winners of the Cold War were the people living in oppressed countries in the Eastern Bloc. And also today, it will be the ordinary people living under dictatorships or authoritarian regimes who in the long term will emerge the victors in the struggles they are facing for the time being. The only question is how long it will take and how much uh, genuine strong support others will give them. We have spoken about this right now. Uh, in the example of China. But for the time being, is it uh, really right to transfer uh, the lessons learned from the period of court war to the present world? So I should say a few words about the complexity of the world in 2016. What about the situation as it is today? East Germany officially known by its leaders as the German Democratic Republic, the Soviet Union, and maybe except uh, for, China, uh, for Cuba and uh, North Korea, all the countries of the so-called socialist world system vanished after 1990. Today, international terrorism, the Islamic State, or Daesh, as it is sometimes called, or other terroristic or criminal groups are dominating the headlines in almost every continent, even for example here, the FARC in Colombia. But what it is, it is a terroristic group or only a criminal group without any uh, longer uh, and, and certain ideology. After 1990, human rights received a boost. In 1989, Francis Fukuyama wrote an essay, The End of History, which was published in the International Affairs Journal, The National Interest. Fukuyama argued, uh, argues that the advent of Western liberal democracies may signal the end point of humanity's socio-cultural <coughs> socio evolution and the final form of human government. Why we may be witnessing is not just the end of the Cold War or the passing of a particular period of post-war history, but the end of history as such. That is the end point of mankind's ideologi <coughs> ideological evolution and the universalization of Western liberal democracy as a final form of human government. Currently, states are not being challenged by oppressed people from inside. Currently, democratic and non-democratic states are being attacked by international terrorism. That does, not mean, that, <laughs> that does not mean that everywhere Islamistic groups are the terrorists as they are, for instance, in Thailand. Outside the Americas, however, Daesh is the most dangerous and I would, and it, <coughs> and it would seem the most as attractive movement. Today, human rights <coughs> are caught uh, in a downward uh, spiral. Many people and therefore many governments have focused on security issues. But they might be going wrong, or maybe they might be going the wrong way again. 
the current world has become incredibly complex. There is no longer one simple solution, no single approach that fits all. Strong and weak national states have not found the way to work together to combat international terrorism. One reason for that could be described as follows. Authoritarian governments are interested in using the term terrorist in a broader, undetermined manner for the suppression of disagreeable people. Liberal democracies fear to speak publicly about the actual danger posed by real terrorists because they want to avoid a feeling among voters of even more insecurity. On the other hand, populist parties are interested in such discussions instead of adequately objective debates to find ways of dealing with these dangers, populists are creating unrest and even relatively stable democracies might become unstable. There is a contradiction per se uh, between human rights and security. Which approach is the best one? depends on concrete conditions and environments. Human rights and security could become part of ideology used for specific interests and not for making sure that human beings can live in dignity. The fifth last point is the role of human rights today. In presenting the report uh, entitled uh, In Larger Freedom in 2005, Kofi Annan, the former uh, UN Secretary General, used the image of world peace based on three pillars, security, development and human rights. He stated that we will not enjoy development without security. We will not enjoy security without development. That means economic prosper prosperity. And we will not enjoy either without respect for human rights. We could therefore say that the realization of human rights throughout the world is the most important prerequisite for human development defined as freedom from poverty and suffering and human security defined as freedom from fear and violence. In the past, defending human rights was a particular foreign policy focus of both the European Union and Germany. Despite uh, advances, human rights are currently under threat from three angles. I will not speak too long about this, but I will mention it. The first, and that is what I have learned in my position at a foreign office uh, dealing with human rights for the German government. The first is a tendency to demand too much in the realm of human rights. That, in the end, very little is achieved. The second is a growing movement that prioritizes the rights of, it, of the collective over individual rights. That started with the right to development. Who is being addressed with development? For individuals, it, it means self-fulfillment. But who can guarantee the welfare of a nation other than the people and its government? When I led the German delegation at the Human Rights Council in Geneva, the organization of the Islamic Conference was advocating collective human rights and that's uh, still true today. This approach is not about protecting the rights of the individual, it is about protecting the rights of a religious group, for instance. This group rights having nothing to do with the original concept of human rights. Individuals, not religions, have human rights. 
the individual has the right and the state is obligated to respect and protect that right. The third angle is uh, the need for security. Ordinary people are right when they want to be protected by the state. But how can a liberal state, limited by the rule of law, avoid the loss of lives when terrorists use suicide bombers? Nowadays, we certainly cannot take it for granted that our understanding of human rights is accepted throughout the world. On the contrary, that understanding is much more at risk than it was 20 or 30 years before ago. This is all the more true when hardly anyone dares to openly address this issue. But the basic approach is actually quite simple. Successful human rights policy is about translating a fantastic idea into, real, into reality. This idea applies to everyone, regardless of whether they uh, were born in Germany or Switzerland or in China, Zimbabwe, Cuba or North Korea. The political art of human rights policy consists of placing the individual in the heart of all efforts, while at the same time taking into account traditions, traditions, culture and religion. This is often particularly difficult when persuasive arguments are put forward by those who consciously disregard human rights for the sake of uh, showing their own power. Let me end with uh, following basic principles for better coordination of human policy, which I wrote in 2009, in the end of my term, uh, when I served as a human rights commissioner for the federal government. I have copied uh, these uh, guidelines, and so I can uh, be brief. Uh, what I wrote uh, describes uh, an ideal situation from a human rights uh, point of view. Politics needs uh, such uh, guidelines, I think, but in the end, a pragmatic approach and a concrete policy focusing on the actual dignity of human beings is needed even more. The, the basic principles uh, contains uh, some uh, specific sentence. You can read this on the on the copies. The, the first is, I think, the human rights uh, should be uh, at the core of the European Union foreign policy. Uh, that is because of maybe the Chinese will care more about uh, for the economy, and the security part is more or less uh, only with the. Uh, United States, so the, the, few, the few actors uh, in, the, in the international arena you can, who can uh, care for the, for the human rights, maybe it's the uh, European Union. That's a big challenge. Yeah, and, and then human rights are universal, and the idea of universality is a political core of the human rights concept. And that is important in some debates with other so-called human rights uh, NGOs. Any attempt uh, anywhere to re relativize the idea must be clearly uh, countered. The protection of cultural diversity, traditions or religions as an alternative political concept to human rights is rejected. What is being advocated is a non-ideological human rights policy that allows for the diversity of cultures, religions and traditions based on the protection of elementary human rights. That, however, requires concentrations, concentration on elementary human rights as such. Only those rights that are without question basic human rights and not rights based on certain cultural or ideological ideas can be applied universally 
universally. That's important, but I will not uh, explain this uh, any longer. Uh, one uh, of the important other issues is human rights policy must improve the situation of people affected by human rights violations worldwide. And that is important. Uh, implementing minimum standards and concrete steps to protect elementary human rights in all countries have priority over extending the catalog uh, of human rights. Human rights should secure a dignified life, not secure the good life. And also the governments of sovereign states bear primary responsibility for the protection of human rights. And human rights protection is not possible without stable states. And strengthening the competence of the uh, independence of the International Criminal Court in The Hague is a key part of human rights policy. Human rights policy must combat impunity. All those uh, very important uh, yeah, guidelines maybe uh, should be also uh, in our mind when we are speaking about human rights uh, from a perspective of Europe or the Western world. And the last uh, idea was international human rights policy must not undermine the protection of basic rights and the rule of law in the European Union member states. It is uh, not only about how to extend uh, our human rights policy and understanding worldwide, it's also how, um, what are the effects or the impact of others uh, to our uh, kind of living together. And maintaining scope for existence in a free democratic and social state based on the rule of law is not sometimes or, or is not something to be taken for granted. Thank you very much.